Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name's Greg, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, I need to preface this by saying a few things. If it's not in a book and it comes out of my mouth, it is my opinion only. And chances are, because my ego is still as big as a mountain, it may not fit your situation. And by the way, my ego is not that big right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> My drinking story is no different uh, than any one or two of you together or alone. It just, the same thing started basically when I was 12. It was great, had a good time for many, many years, functioned through growing up, through most of my marriage. <laughs> and uh, owning my own business, my own house, and then it all came to a a crash and halt, like most of us have had it happen. And except for, except for the love of uh, my ex and a couple of very, very good friends and this program, I shouldn't be here. I would not be here. A very serious point of uh, my sobriety has been spirituality, which um, I forgot about. For many a year, I was raised Catholic um, and was into the religion as, as a kid because my parents and I went to a Catholic uh, elementary school and high school and then seemed to forget about it and about my relationship with the higher power. I became my own higher power, then turned it over to my wife. <laughs> and like, I, from what I understand, a whole lot of us have done that to our significant others. After 15 years, she said, that's it. She stuck with me through the death of my mother and my father. She took the kids. I lost the house, lost the family, lost my business, and did not, did not drink for two years. Did not do this either, not this program. I stayed... Uh, in a dark hole to one night I had had it surrounded myself with a bunch of photos of my family and put a gun in my mouth at which time it, I didn't care and until my cat came up sat on my lap and gave me this look like if you do that they're not going to find you for days and no one's going to be here to feed me in a fit of tears I put the gun down and started petting the cat and within 30 seconds the phone rang and on the other side of it was uh, my friend David calling from up here. I'm in Central California at the time. Invited me up to uh, help him get a business started. Which time I just, I left the house, left it to a real estate agent. You sell this, goodbye, boom. <clears throat> Came up here with as little as I could and stayed for uh, about half a year until I missed the kids. Still no program. Still dark. Moved back to about 30 miles from the kids. Got an apartment. I went in to apply for a job, and the very first place I went into hired me, and I spent the next three weeks on an adventure of sitting between two guys in a truck going from Sacramento to Travis Air Force Base who talked nothing but this program. <laughs> turned out that everybody in the place that I had been hired by was in this program. <laughs> the guy who hired me had 12 years of this program, and I listened and listened and listened for about two months. Came to New Year's Eve, 1999, and <clears throat> in a contest in front of my ex-wife and her new boyfriend, I chugged a 12-ounce beer, beat every damn one of them, just I proved to the woman who watched me fall down for 12 years that I could still drink. Uh, didn't get the idea that maybe didn't impress her too much for a few years after that. But. <laughs> um, I stayed with this in, with uh, 
in Sacramento for quite a while after that. Spoke with my ex-brother-in-law one night, and he said, you know, there isn't a day he had had about ten years that he that I go through life, and I don't say the serenity prayer at least six times, and I swear to God I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. You might try a meeting. So January the 3rd, 2000, I did my first meeting for me. I've been to other ones with other people, but I didn't have the problem at this time, right? Um, and I've been here ever since. My first sponsor broke the rules was a lady of 72 years old who had 34 years of sobriety. And I did not realize it until recently, but there was a reason for that. She, uh, in my fifth and sixth step, or my fifth step, pointed a whole lot of things out about how gracious I and grateful I sh should be regarding my past life and the fact that I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for it happening the way it did. I got hurt two years ago on the job, and um, out of sheer boredom, I moved back up here, joined my home group in Sunrise. Met some really, really neat people. I still am. Um, and I've come to the conclusion that my higher power, along with, the, like I said earlier, has kept me alive, has made it possible to take the mountains and bring them down to the mole hills that they are, have made it possible to go through rather than around or over or under, or however I used to get through my life. There are people out there who have twice to three times the time I have in this program who sometimes get just as confused about life and just as egotistical as I do. And that's what amazes me, is I know what works here. I know how to do it, and I know when to do it. But for some reason, every once in a while, my ego will kick in gear and just drive me down the same road that I've been down over and over and over, and it will take me. I can go to maybe three or four meetings and not get it. I can say my prayers every day and every night and not get it. That it takes a certain combination of things. It takes talking to people who've been through the same thing. It takes praying every day and every night. Sometimes, and this works, folks, when things really get desperate, lock yourself in the bathroom, get on your knees and pray. I was told that by the guy who hired me in Sacramento, and I laughed it off, but it worked. <coughs> calms me down. It makes me fit, as I should. I've watched people, more people die as a result of this disease, including that best friend's wife just a couple of years ago. People have been close to me. People have gotten close to me in this program, more than I ever saw before I joined this program. I just lost a dear friend in my home group a couple of weeks ago. It's deadly. And I pray to God that you get what this has to offer, that you get what it's given me. And I also pray that I never, ever get fin become come to a point where I've got it. Because at that point in time, if I ever think that I have learned this and all there is to take in, my ego will have taken over. And that will be the end. I don't ever want to be complete here. I want to thank all of you uh, that I've met in this program. And those friends who aren't here, who hopefully are listening, those of you I will meet for what you've given, what you've said, for the hugs, for the smiles, and for the just little hellos, I wouldn't be here without you because you are the biggest part of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And our second seven to ten minute speaker is Nancy. Is this enough? Can you hear me now? You need, I need to stand closer? Okay. No, no, you need to stand. 16, 17 seconds. Here we go. My, 
My, I'm Nancy. I'm a very grateful alcoholic, and I'm awfully glad to be here. A lot of people, yikes. Anyway, I, um, my sobriety date is February 10, um, 1992. My first sobriety date was July 4th, 17, no, 19. <laughs> Nineteen seventy-six. <laughs> okay, so I was uh, I was happily uh, going to AA and doing everything I was supposed to do and feeling like you know, boy, I know everything. And um, after fifteen and a half years of, of sobriety, I had a slip. And I had a slip in a situation uh, that hadn't occurred to me before during those fifteen years, but. No, there's no excuse to drink, okay? And the thing that's got me on this, I want to talk about step seven, and the thing that's got me on this run is because um, what I realized when that situation happened, I only drank for about three days, and then only surreptitiously because I was in another country and I couldn't find any booze. So I uh, I did my, my best, and uh, <laughs> some of it was good enough because one guy said, you can't have another drink in the bar. Oh, dear. So... <laughs> We spoke the same language anyway. I, I got out. So then um, what happened was that for the first time in my life, you know, uh, maybe after, oh, well, I sat there in my home group, which I went to immediately as soon as I could get myself there. Um, and, you know, when the question came, is anybody here in their first 30 days? I said, no, I'm Nancy, and I'm an alcoholic. My God. You know, it was very hard for me to say it, and I knew I had to. And there was no doubt in my mind, nobody told me, well, you've got to start again from step one, you know, from the beginning, first day. Forget it. No, I did it. I knew I had to do it, and I knew I had to go back, and I wanted to go back. That was the great thing. To leave, to leave my friends in that group would have been the death for me. I loved them, and I loved the group, and I loved everything about it. It was really amazing. So I was very, very lucky. And... For the first time, as I said in my life, I did not blame the situation on the fact that I drank. For some reason, I got it that, you know, I can't do that. But I have another addiction. It's one of my most horrible defects, which I've realized since this thing happened. And that is that um, I have what I've named blamism. Uh, I blame, I, I grew up either being blamed or blaming. And my whole household was that way. We were, we were all, same. And uh, we learned well. So uh, I never knew this about myself. You know, the thing is that until I started to read the steps, and I every time I would read a step, I'd say, yeah, well, I get that. But I didn't see that the last time. You know, each time there's a new thing that comes out, another pearl falls into your lap, and you say, oh, my God, I missed that. Well, when I got, when I read the seventh step, I couldn't believe it. You know, now these are my words, because, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what it says. To me, it meant if you if you have a defect which you need to do something about, you, you just have to realize what it is that makes you keep going back to the same thing. And over and over, you do it over and over, and then everything is the same. And so... I, I stayed in the same place. I wasn't, um, I wasn't particularly unhappy, but I was full of self-pity, and I missed an awful lot. I, when you're in, a, in this cage of blame, you can't, you can't come out of it. I mean, you know, you can't have much compassion for anybody, and you can't um, trust people, and you have, you're sort of in a circle of fear because you, you, do, you don't want to be blamed. But... When I was really bad about blaming, I, well, of course I drank, so it didn't matter. I didn't care what happened. But then I read the seventh step and I thought, oh my gosh, I could, I could try to think about that. Maybe I'm one of these people that hasn't thought about these things enough or I haven't thought about them at all. And concerning my own, I, I, I began to hear myself starting to blame, you know, the light was too bright. That's why I couldn't see the book, you know, whatever. And uh, I, I started. I started to notice these things, and I thought, "Whoa! I can. I can do a little bit about this. I can. I can. I can read step seven again, <laughs> and I can talk about it, which I did, and which I have done for 
all these years now, um, 12 years, and it's, what is it going on? 12, it's 12 years going on, uh, to 13. If I'm lucky, in February I'll have my 13th birthday, so I feel really, I feel really proud about that. And I've been tremendously pleased because I've been able to work with a couple of lovely young women, uh, as a sponsor, you know, and I think, yeah, they're so young and they're so lovely. And you know, <laughs> here I am as a, I'm an old hag, you know. <laughs> I don't know why I say, why do you want to ask me, you know, what do you think? Well, because you've got this, whatever it is. Not because I'm rich, though. That's good. <laughs> so anyway, um, I've been lucky. I've been lucky, and I've worked very, very, very hard. Uh, I was real skeptic before in the first 15 years. I didn't think any of this had anything to do with me, but, well, you know, act as if. So I'd acted as if. And then I really began to feel good about it. And I moved from New York um, to Portland um, around the 11th year so, I don't know, I changed a lot when I got here. I couldn't, I couldn't believe this place. <laughs> it's very different from New York City. And I thought, gee, why have I come here? You know, and I've, I've, <laughs> I've been wondering why I came here ever since. <laughs> but, you know, once I got next to the seven stuff, I know why I came here. I came here because it's the only way I could have gotten into the situation that I got into that caused me to slip. And it's the only way I could have gone way beyond where I was and where I really became willing. You know, I really, really did. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just very, very grateful because I've had this wonderful opportunity to begin to grow up. And I feel like maybe I've got more emotional sobriety than I've ever had, or any kind of sobriety. So I don't know how this thing is. According to this, I've only been talking for seven minutes. Are my glasses wrong? I can you? That makes it eight. Oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> this is so funny. Oh, I love you people. You're, you're so great. I got a dry mouth, but I feel so comfortable with you all, you know? Thank you. Thank you a million times for listening to me and uh, inviting me or I'm Gary for that. I work at the Indie Group every week for a half a day, and it's that's been the start of my happy, happy day. <laughs> this man is my boss. <laughs> so I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. And our main speaker is Gary. How do you turn this damn thing off? Anyway? <laughs> My name's Gary. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Gary. And I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Look at all these beaming faces, all, the, all these beautiful people here tonight. All of these beautiful people, we're all here for the same thing. You know, we all have something in common, and it's recovery, and it's being sober, and finding out how to do it together, and how to, how to be better people together, sober. I'm going to break rank a little bit. We, had, we asked for the newcomers here tonight, those people with 30 days of sobriety. Are there any other alcoholics here tonight? Anybody an alcoholic? <clears throat> okay, now look at, look at that. Look around for a minute. Everybody in here, for the most part, is an alcoholic. For, so you new people, this isn't a setup just for you. They're, they're all here, too, for the same reason. They want to recover from alcoholism. I do. I want to recover from alcoholism. I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous because I want to recover from alcoholism. In the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it talks about being recovered. You know, so we can, we can be recovered. 
But, you know, I don't know when I became alcoholic. I really don't. I, I thought a lot about it when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous and, and uh, probably way too much about it. But I was trying to figure out when I became alcoholic. So the only thing I could do was kind of base it on when I had my first drink and then what happened when I started drinking alcoholically. So my first real drink, <clears throat> you know, other than a sip of beer of my folks, was uh, I was a... Am I supposed to tell them when I got sober? Is that part of your format? All right. Oct October 21st, 1977. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean anything, by the way. You know, I got sober when I was 24 years old, and I grew up in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, so there's a, I created a lot of wreckage in my sobriety, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But Okay, so I'm 11 years old. My parents come home with two bottles of champagne, pink champagne, Napoleon, pink champagne, for myself and my two sisters, my younger sister, you know, four years younger, and my older sister, about five years older than I. And they were going out. My parents were going out for New Year's Eve. And, you know, it was normal. That, that was normal back then. It was, wasn't even really a problem. You know, nobody would have called up a, a child protection agency over that. You know, that's just what, what happened. It was fine. So they said, here, kids, have fun. Don't go anywhere, and uh, we'll see you when we get back. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> You know, that was great. You know, that, that's great. We have our own champagne and little champagne glasses. And that Christmas, I had gotten a tape recorder, and I loved that tape recorder. I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. But I also was kind of a, a scientist-thinking kid. I used to, you know, like to, to, to read science things and think, think like a scientist. And so I decided that, you know, here we have some champagne, and I've never been drunk before, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a science experiment, and I'm gonna record the effects of alcohol. <laughs> you know, so we popped the bottle off, or the cap off the first one, and, and poured a little glass, and I, I drank it. And I remember, you know, just sitting there, and, and after a couple of minutes, and I recorded the effects of, of that first drink. And then the, the, the second one, you know, regular champagne glasses, just a little bit. The second one, the third one, the fourth. Now, I remember vaguely getting to about 11 or 12 drinks. And I remember thinking, oh, man, i got to protect my tape recorder. I'm going to drop it. I'm going to go put it someplace safe now. And, and that it made sense. <clears throat> so I... I wandered around the house with it, and I finally found this this bar stool that was just barely standing up. And I, I set it on that, and it kind of wiggled, and, and I said, okay, that's great. It'll be safe there for the rest of the night. I went back out into the living room, got my glass, went into the kitchen, and poured another glass of champagne. And I drank the rest of the champagne. Um, okay, a bottle and a half of champagne I drank. They drank a half a bottle. <clears throat> now, I really remember some things about that night. I remember pink champagne coming out <laughs> everywhere, coming out. I remember going in and trying to brush my teeth and squirting toothpaste all over the bathroom. I remember... <laughs> Can I have that bottle of water right there by your feet? Thanks. I remember thinking, I need to go to bed. I've got to go to bed now. So... I wandered into my bedroom. My, my little sister and I shared a bedroom. We hated each other. We hated each other, but we shared a bedroom. And we really didn't hate each other, but we acted like it. And I would never touch anything of hers. But I walked into the bedroom, and I walked over, and, I, and, I, and I'm getting ready to fall on my bed, and I just fell on hers instead. It, all of the, whole, the rest of the night was like that. I never could do what I thought I was going to do. Okay, now... To fast forward a little bit, I woke up the next day or came to or whatever you want to call it, and my parents were treating me. And three days later, you know, when the, I mean, I had alcohol poisoning. Here's this little 11-year-old kid. That's a lot of booze to drink for 11. <clears throat> and I remember thinking, I will never, ever, 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 ever drink alcohol again. <clears throat> now, I also had another reason to not do that. My my father was a raging, vicious, mean alcoholic. And every night when uh, he would come home, he would get drunk and fight with my mother. And, uh, and, and it was very violent, very, very violent. You know, the, the peace came, you know, for me when I would finally go to sleep. And also that night that I drank the champagne, there, you know, there was some peace there. You know, I was, we were having fun, you know, but I knew that 
okay, this makes me feel this way. It makes him get that way. I got to avoid this stuff. And I did. Um, I avoided it because six months later, somebody gave me an herbal remedy for alcoholism. <laughs> and they said, you know, this herbal remedy will make it so that you can, you can have fun, you know, be carefree, uh, no hangovers, no this, no that. And I said, great, let's try it. And so for the next several years, I used that herbal remedy so I didn't have to drink. And I didn't have to, you know, and I didn't want to. And everything was great. But, the, you know, the alcoholism was still in my home, still in the family. I watched that uh, continue on. Now, uh, fast forward. We divorced Dad. We moved to Oregon. I'm 15 years old now. And my mother says, why don't you go in the... Uh, the house and get me and my friend a couple of beers out of the refrigerator. I said, great, no problem. I ran into the house, pulled out two, what were they? I don't know, beers out of the refrigerator, uh, Miller's, and uh, I cracked the top off of one and guzzled it. Where did that come? I said to myself, where did that come from? Why did I do that? I was never going to drink again. Why am I drinking now? I d there's no reason, but man, that kind of felt good. And uh, and it did. It kind of felt good. But I'll tell you something. All through high school, you know, I had a lot of friends that drank and got drunk. And it was, you know, it was, you know, you'd go buy a couple of cases of beer and you'd go out and and you would drink. But I didn't really participate. I would drink a beer or a beer and a half, and I would get dizzy, and that was it. I would I'd stop. I mean, I I couldn't do that with them. And I I remembered my father, and I remembered the insanity, and it was it was terrible. You know, I'll spare you some of the details, but I guarantee you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but something happened, and a few years later, graduated, moved to uh, back to uh, Southern California. Uh, things changed. I decided that it would be okay to drink socially with my friends, but I'll, by the time I was about 21 years old, I was drinking alcoholically. And part of the reason I was drinking alcoholically because I moved someplace where I couldn't find my herbal remedy anymore. It was gone. <laughs> But the farmer that I was working for used to drink Old Crow first thing in the morning. I moved to Oklahoma. You know, here's this kid, this, this city kid moving to Oklahoma and living on a farm. And I thought that was fantastic. And I was having a blast. And I learned how to drink whiskey in Oklahoma. And I learned, you know, that if you drank whiskey straight on an empty stomach, man, it got you going. It was all right. You know, you didn't have to drink that much of it either. You know, the champagne, you'd have to drink a lot of it. Beer, you'd have to drink a lot of it. But if you drink some whiskey on an empty stomach first thing in the morning, it lit you up. And it, you know, and I didn't care if I had to sit on that tractor for 18 hours. I had a blast. I mean, it was the greatest thing. I said, geez, now I know why my dad drank. I mean, I remember thinking that. So, you know, I started this off saying, when did I become alcoholic? You know, when did I become alcoholic? Chances are, from the get-go, I mean the get-go, before I ever drank, alcoholic. Got back to Los Angeles. My wife got sober, kicked me out of the house. She said, you're on a dead-end road. Get out of here. And I said, okay. And I left. And uh, I said, and we've heard this, you know, in AA, now I can drink the way I want to anyway. You know, so I'm glad I'm gone. I can drink the way I want to now. Because she's going to these AA meetings. She's been going for about a month. And she's really getting disgusting. You know. I mean, I gotta hide my drinking now. I gotta go to the, I gotta walk down to the liquor store and buy a beer, which I don't like to drink beer. I like to drink whiskey and tequila and, and vodka and stuff like that. I'd have to buy a beer and a half pint, drink the half pint on the way home and then walk in with the beer so I could pretend I'm just drinking a beer. You know, that, that's what I did. I had to do that because now, because she's going to AA. So what am I going to do? Anyway, she kicked me out and I started drinking the way I wanted to. And thank God she invited me to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting at one point. I went. I don't know why I went, but I went to an AA meeting with her. And I saw a group of people just like you, beaming, energetic, having a good time. And I said, they can't be alcoholic. They can't, I don't know what's going on. They're having a good time. You know, it's kind of a neat place. I know I don't belong here. I don't fit in. I don't feel inside like you look outside. But it's, this is kind of interesting. And I left, and uh, somebody gave me his phone number that night. 
And I said, thanks, I don't know what this is for, but I'll take it. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> now, back then, I had a full beard and long hair, you know, 70s, right? Just still doing the kind of the hippie thing. Uh, and I didn't look anything like anybody in the room because nobody had long hair. And the men, not, there wasn't a single mustache in the room. There wasn't a single, no sideburns, no goatees, nothing. Clean-shaven, good-looking guys, well-dressed and manicured, and they all looked like, I don't know, you know, businessmen or something. I didn't quite understand it. But anyway, uh, a few months later, uh, I found myself going back to that meeting again with her. And the reason I had you raise your hands, you know, earlier, are there any other alcoholics? That's what they used to do at this meeting. You know, they, the, the, the chairperson would say, hi, I'm Gary, I'm an alcoholic. Are there any other alcoholics here? Everybody would raise their hand. I raised my hand there. Now, they weren't asking for newcomers. They were saying, are there any other alcoholics here? And I said, yes. I'm an, you know, that's what I'm telling myself. Yes, I'm an alcoholic. Huh. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I'm an alcoholic. No commitment. I mean, I wasn't saying I was sober alcoholic, but I was, in, you know, <laughs> I'm an alcoholic. And I left, and I thought about that. And I said, geez, Gary, you are an alcoholic. Because I'd been questioning people that I knew, you know, had some AA affiliation on what is an alcoholic so that I wouldn't behave that way. You know, I, I, if, I just, if I could just not drink like an alcoholic, I could keep drinking. And I kept having to change how I drank because I was drinking like an alcoholic, so I'd do it different, and then I'd find somebody that would ruin that too. I, uh, the last day that I drank, and I remember it just you know as well as I remember this afternoon, the last drink that I had, I looked at the clock, and the clock said 10 minutes to 2 a.m. And uh, I had a pint of whiskey, and there was a little bit left in it, and I drank it. I was staying at a friend's house that night. I always, see, I, I was a safe drinker. I would, and, you know, pretty much broke all the time, too. So I would go buy booze. I wouldn't drink out in public because it's more expensive. I'd go buy my booze and go home and, and drink and pass out every night. That's what I did. But this night, I was at a friend's house, and I drank the booze and the last of it out of my bottle. And I'd been drinking all day. And I looked at the clock, and I said, if, you know, if I hurry, I can get to the liquor store before it closes. And I thought about it for a minute. I thought about how much I'd been drinking all day and, and for days and for weeks. And I was a daily drinker, and I would start first thing in the morning, by the way, if I hadn't mentioned that. And I'd been doing that for a couple of years. And uh, I said, what's the use? And I just kind of knocked the bottle over and just slumped back in the couch and said, what's the use? I can't get drunk anyway. You know, it had stopped working. It had, it had stopped working a long time ago. But I kept trying to find that, that right mixture, you know, drink at the right time and don't eat for days and drink and do something to get the alcohol to work again. And it quit working. You know, my body was kind of drunk, but, the, you know, I'm, zzz, you know, just this negative thing that I was living with in my mind. I couldn't shut the mind off anymore. I got up that next morning, and usually what I would do first thing in the morning is I'd go out the back door and walk down two blocks to the liquor store, and I would buy a pack of cigarettes, a Tiger's Milk uh, candy bar, and a half pint of whiskey. And that was breakfast. Now, I had to buy it like that. <clears throat> I had to buy it in half pints because if I bought a fifth, I would drink it until it was gone. You know, and, and, and at night, you know, I couldn't buy a fifth at night because I would wake up and it would be empty, and I wouldn't remember drinking it. So... I learned that, uh, you know, I'd have to control my drinking by the quantity of the bottle. You know, just unscrew it, and, and I would drink it. I couldn't not drink it all. So, but that morning was different. I got up, and I was at somebody else's house, and it had been like two hours. I'd been up for like two hours, and I hadn't had a drink yet. And something was starting to happen. And I was getting kind of shaky inside, and, and I finally said, I got, I got to go home. And I made it home, barely. I walked into the house, and... Uh, See if I can get through this without uh, crying, so we can use my time wisely here. I uh, I fell on the floor, face down, and uh, I didn't have much of a relationship with any kind of a higher power, God, or anything else. I, I uh, kind of had a vague concept that maybe there was something going on in the universe other than you know my sick thinking. But uh, I I genuinely said, God, please help me not do this anymore. I will do anything. 
And I meant that. I mean, I really meant that because I was so terrified of drinking again that day. Now, what's different today from yesterday? You know, the only thing that was really different was that two hours had gone by after I'd woken up and hadn't had a drink. But there was something else going on. And it was a moment of clarity. Now, in hindsight, you know, I, I know exactly what was going on. And I said that prayer, and I called my sister, and I told her, and I found out later I had called her many, many, many times for help, many times, and many other people. Uh, But that day, she sensed that something was different. So she came over. She drove me around. We went to a couple of halfway houses and detox places, and I said, something's wrong. Just take me home. So she took me home. Later that afternoon, I got a phone call. And it was from the one and only uh, treatment center in Los Angeles at the time. It was called the Care Unit. And uh, this real sweet, angelic voice on the other side was listening to me, and I was just pouring it out, just like my, you know, being, you know, with my at my first AA AA meeting, talking about, you know, what I'd been doing. And I told her about all the drinking and all the drugs and all the insanity and how I was sick of it. And she just listened and and told me that everything was going to be okay. And uh, I felt. I felt someone touch me inside. I felt hope. And she said, why don't you come down and we'll, you know, we'll show you around the care unit and, and, you know, see what we can do to get you into treatment. Now, I had no insurance, no money, no, no way at all to pay for any kind of treatment. There was, it was, that was impossible. I had used up everybody in my family. I had, I had soaked everybody for every penny that I could just to keep drinking. There was no way anybody had anything else for me because I would have just used it for drinking. It would have happened. Had I gotten money from them, my moment of clarity would have been history because I would have drank. Anyway, um, my relationship with my higher power began that day. And uh, it, it began because the, the help arrived immediately as soon as I asked for it and meant it and surrendered. But then I'm thinking, how am I going to get there? I still had a car. I'm not physically capable. Now I'm getting ready to go into DTs. Maybe I'm already in DTs. I don't know. But I I stood up and I felt assistance helping me walk out to my car physically. Somebody, something was helping me walk to my car. I got in it. I drove 30 minutes to this hospital in Gardena, California. And I walked into this hospital, and I walked up to the third floor and and walked up to the nurse's desk, feeling this assistance all the way, because I couldn't stand up. I I walked up to the nurse's desk, and I said, I think I need an AA meeting. Where did that come from? I'm going to check in to see what this care unit's all about. I think I need an AA meeting. And the lady said, you see those two people over there right now by the elevator? They're going to one right now downstairs. Just follow them. And I felt, you know, these arms or the hands under my arms carry me and guide me over to the elevator. And I followed them down to this AA meeting. Now, here's the funny thing. This AA meeting wasn't like this. It was a a regular hospital cafeteria. Uh, it was normally it was an AA meeting like this, but this night they had a special film. <clears throat> so the, you know, the curtain opens and the film starts, and it's Walter Matthau and and uh, Jack Lemmon, and they're doing Bill and Bob. You know, one of the first uh, renditions of how AA got started. And I sat there and I watched that, and I was impressed. And it and it it actually did what an AA meeting would do. When the thing was over, I was in tears. I said, geez, you know, I, I'm home. This AA is, is where I need to be. And a whole bunch of people came up after me, or came up around me after the meeting and they gave me their phone numbers and they, you know, they gave me some direction for the rest of the night. I, uh, they loved me. See, I, I felt that. They were loving me. And I hadn't felt love from anybody for a long time, especially from myself. Uh, I made it back home that night. And I remember, geez, you know, about nine months ago, I was in an AA meeting, and a guy gave me his phone number. Now, I had, you know, grocery sacks full of whiskey bottles in my room. All my clothes were ripped up. I mean, from trying to get undressed drunk. There was nothing left. What wasn't ripped up was molding or mildewing in the chair, because I'd take it to the laundromat and get it to, through the wash, but couldn't get it through the dryer, and I'd drag it home wet and throw it in the chair. I had nothing left. And uh, everything was destroyed, and I had this one little dresser with a couple of drawers in it just full of junk. And I opened it up, 
and reached in and picked out that guy's phone number. And I mean, after all that time, why would I have, why would that phone number be there? And I called him up and I said, Rob, this is uh, Gary, blah, blah. He remembered me. He said, okay, well, I'll meet you tomorrow at this AA function. And I met him at that AA function and I went to that AA meeting that night and I've been sober ever since. Now, my, re you know, I've been sober in AA because of AA, because I surrendered and I didn't want to drink again, and I was terrified of drinking again. Fear, just pure fear, kept me going to AA for the first few weeks. Fear of drinking. You know, I was sober for four days, and I got up in the morning one day, and I walked out the back door, and I'm walking to the liquor store. My mind wasn't walking to the liquor store. My body was. It was taken, and it terrified me. I ran back into the house, and I made all the, you know, called every phone number that I had, I got on my knees and I prayed to, you know, to that thing that I was learning about in AA. And, uh, you know, I felt a little bit better and I knew I had a meeting to go to that night. And I went to that meeting and I talked about it. And uh, I learned that if I do what, what I'm taught in Alcoholics Anonymous, I don't have to drink, no matter what. I don't have to drink. Now, I'm just going to run down a f real fast laundry list, okay, of, of uh, my life. Um, <laughs> Other than the insanity part, right, which I, I brought with me to Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, there's bankruptcy, multiple wives, uh, unemployment, uh, unemployable, welfare, car crashes, all that stuff in sobriety. None of it when I was drinking. None of it. Nothing. No ticket, not getting fired, nothing. <laughs> So you you know you hear people say yet yet that didn't happen yet well I was 24 I was a I was barely a kid now I got sober I stopped drinking I started doing what you taught me to do every day I exposed myself to Alcoholics Anonymous every day every night I did all the things because I was afraid of drinking and I've been doing that for a long time now. But I learned that just because I stopped drinking didn't mean that I wasn't still suffering from alcoholism, you know, the ism part. You know, people say to me, well, why do you keep going to AA? You know, why, why do you have to go to AA? And I said, well, I'll tell you something. It's not necessarily about me not drinking, because I've been not drinking for a long time now, but I am uh, participating here in this uh, material existence as a spiritual being on planet Earth, and I seem to have something screwed up. You know, I'm not, the signals aren't quite getting there, you know, like other people. And I found out that I was drinking to try and improve that situation, to improve that perception. I was drinking alcohol to improve that. I got sober, now what? You know, I found out that I drank because of sobriety. I drank alcohol because of the way I felt when I wasn't drinking alcohol. Okay, so now I'm going to AA on a regular basis, and I've got a sponsor, I'm very active. You know, and by the way, you guys are a great example. This is a very active group. That's the kind of group that I was in. You know, I call it my AA boot camp. And they said, fake it till you make it, and you show up, and you do what you say you're going to do. And you go talk to that guy over there, you go talk to Chris, and you get a commitment at that meeting so that you can be there every week. And if you're not going to be there, you get somebody to take your place. And by the way, you better get permission not to be there first. I mean, it was boot camp, and, and I, I accepted that. I was unteachable the day before I got sober. The day I got sober, I became teachable because of fear. I also became willing, I, and I also had a sponsor that told me, Gary, you've got to work on your attitude a little bit. And I, and I didn't even know what that meant. You know, I was not a stupid person, but uh, what do you mean my attitude? This is what's kept me alive. You know, who, th this attitude that you're talking about. No, this, this attitude was killing me. And he, he kept telling me that. And he kept telling me that I'm thinking too much and I'm trying to analyze this thing too much. And you just got to just shut up and listen and just take direction. <clears throat> okay, then the steps show up. Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I learned years later that these steps are not to be taken just once when you're new dealing with the drinking part. I mean, that's a good thing to do. You know, it can help you stay sober long enough to realize that just because you're not drinking, you know, me, just because you're not drinking doesn't mean it's over. The journey's not over. The journey's beginning now. 
Now I have a chance to become the person that I was intended to be. Now, I've been growing up in AA for a long time now. I'm still growing up in AA. I don't want to be finished. You know, I don't want to be finished. I was wondering for a long time, what is God's will for me? And I would take that question to everybody. But what's God's will for me, for God's sake? You know, I'd want to get up and find a note on the table in the morning. (laughs) Gary, this is what I want you to do today. (laughs) I prayed for that. I discovered, by the way, that I was being shown every day what God's will was for me in many, many ways. But my, I had this one sponsor. I moved from L.A. and moved to Hawaii, and, and uh, my life went to my, my program was now vacant. See, I wasn't around this energetic group anymore. There was five guys in flops, you know, coming late to the meetings, wearing Hawaiian shirts, being real relaxed, you know, Hawaii. And I walked in ready for my, you know, there's no, none of this, none of the high Gary's, none of that stuff, just, you know, real Hawaiian style AA. It was great, great spiritual energy. But there was this one guy that I would watch, and he kept talking about the steps over and over and over again. Finally, I said, would you please sponsor me and teach me this stuff? I'd been sober about four years. I'd worked the steps once, and I thought that was it. He said, no, Gary, that's not it. That's just the bare beginning. These these tools here have been given to us spiritually. You know, these are tools for you to use for the rest of your life to continue to grow. And, you know, later on, he he helped me with God's will for me. He said, if you've got to have something to think about, you know, here's something for you. God's will for you is for you to be sober, teachable, willing to grow, that you live in peace, joy, harmony, and prosperity with love. I said, wow. Okay. But what does he want me to do? (laughs) Gary, you know, so he went on. Now, I discovered that uh, that doesn't matter. Uh, What he wants me to be, what she wants me to be, what I want me to be, is what I can learn in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, using the steps. I'm powerless over alcohol. My life's become unmanageable. Uh, That hasn't stopped just because I'm sober. Life keeps happening. We all know that life is 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 uh, sometimes very difficult, no matter what. I've dealt with many, many difficult things in my sobriety. I didn't have to drink. didn't have to drink at all. <laughs> the process of the steps for me has become something that's so ingrained in my life as a result of that, that one particular sponsor showing me how to use these tools, you know, for me, for my growth. You know, we all have our own path here. You know, we meet here. We, this is an AA meeting. We meet here and we share this energy. We go out there and that's an AA living. Okay, there's not always an AA member right here. And there's not always a phone number. The 12th step says we learn to practice these principles in all our affairs. Mm, that's kind of a big leap, you know, but 1 through 11 gets us there. You know, and over and over and over again. 30 minutes certainly isn't enough time to talk about the steps, considering I only have one minute to go, Chris. (laughs) Next time, I want you to consider that when you invite me to speak, okay? (laughs) But, you know, what I'm saying is, is that you gotta, you gotta, I gotta expose myself over and over and over and over and over to this stuff. That we get here. You know, I come to AA not, not because of drinking. I come to AA because of everything else that it's given me. It's given me the opportunity to be the person I was intended to be. And I can make all those mistakes and I can learn how to do it better. And I can be sober, teachable, and willing to grow. And I have to be sober, teachable, and willing to grow. I feel better today than I have ever felt in my life because I'm a little bit further along in my program now. You know, I've learned, I've applied the principles of the program a little longer, more, a little more demonstration, you know, for me. And a little less thinking, a little more demonstration. You know, less thinking, more demonstration. It's been proven to me over and over again that everything is always supplied to me. You know, it's just how I relate myself to my spiritual nature, to my higher power. And I have been shown how to do that. When I have a bad, you know, resentments, you hear about resentments, I've got to mention that. See, resentments kill us. It tells us that in in the material. Resentments kill us. Well, how? Because first it kills your thinking. 
okay, that you're thinking. Now, if you're resentful at somebody, you can't be blissful at the same time. You know, so I'm used to being negative. See, I grew up being negative. I know how to do that, and I can go with it. So as soon as I get a little resentful at somebody, that default takes over. And now I'm anything, you know, but blissful or have serenity or peace of mind. It's gone. Now, however, you know, the good news is I've exposed myself to Alcoholics Anonymous long enough that, that I kind of laugh at myself after a little while and go, geez, you've just wasted three hours of your day or maybe three days of the week, or maybe three weeks of the month. But I can stop it now. And as a rule, it doesn't have to go on and on and on and on into negativity. You know, I haven't had to do a lot of those things that I did the first 10 or 15 years of my sobriety, you know, learning mistakes. None of you have to do any of it. But I I wasn't uh, a very fast learner. I thought I had to be self-made, meaning make all my own mistakes, you know, not learn from you. <laughs> I, I can do that now. You know, I was taught to listen to everybody that's talking at the meeting. Listen to them. If you start drifting off, come back and listen to them. No matter who or what they are, what they're saying, they've got something for me to hear. And I've conditioned myself to do that. I, I need to, you know, why waste my time at an AA meeting if I'm not going to listen to the people that are talking? There's good things here and there's bad things here, and we can learn from all of them. You know, and we learn how to stay sober, how to have a chance to be that person that we were intended to be. And my God, look at this. You know, you can come to a room full of people and have all this wonderful positive energy on a regular basis, on a regular basis. When I was brand new, that's what kept me coming to these meetings. Not because I was getting stuff, because I was feeling stuff. I would come here and feel that energy, and I would want it. I would want it desperately, and I'd get to the next day, and just I couldn't wait to my next AA meeting so I could get some more of that feeling. And after a while, I was able to understand that I could be a little bit more proactive and start to apply the principles of the program, you know, to my life, to me, you know, to this this broken person. And uh, those instincts that had gone astray that the book talks about, the 12 and 12 specifically, you know, it told me that my instincts had gone astray. So it took me a while to learn what those were. And I'm still learning. You know, I'm not done. I'm not finished. I am not finished. I don't want to be finished. It's too much fun. You know, it really is. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love what I learned from Alcoholics Anonymous. I love the experience I have every day of my life because exclusively of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have a chance today. I have a chance. I have a beautiful family. Wonderful job. I've always worked more than one job. That's the way that it is for Gary. That's okay. Just my attitude and you do what you have to do. I have a beautiful home, wonderful family. Everybody in my family is sober now. They don't all go to AA, but they don't have to drink. You know, so we can be, uh, we can demonstrate for people whether they go to AA or not, we can still demonstrate for them and they can, they can also benefit, you know, from what we have here. But I'd like to thank Chris and everybody and the newcomers. You know, I, I may not have said anything here, uh, that helped you, but someone will. And, you know, keep coming to AA meetings. Somebody's going to say something that's going to ring your bell and make you want to come back. And you just show up no matter what. Just just keep coming no matter what. And it, it will get better. And there's always a way to deal with whatever the perceived problem is. There's friends, and there's a lot of love and a lot of compassion, and just unlimited experience in Alcoholics Anonymous to share with each other. And all we have to do is just ask for it, and it will come flooding in, I guarantee you. Thank you all. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.